What is it that we need to tell ourselves, particularly as activists, as progressives, and as members of the public who have a genuine concern that we do indeed build on the successes of the present? The first is, of course, that the first 20 year honeymoon is over. Tough things have to be done in order to ensure that some of those mistakes we talk about, some of the challenges that we face today, we ourselves have to challenge and meet and correct so that we don't leave that challenge to future generations to undertake. The post apartheid, and in doing so, we must recognize that the post apartheid state was not designed to be free of contestation and contradiction. You see, dreaming is one thing, the reality is another. As society develops, we get our democracy, life changes. Ten years after democracy, life changes again. Twenty years later, you have more competition. I thought the program director was mimicking a few politicians earlier on. I'm sure her, her mimicking of the young man uh, wasn't, offended, uh, wasn't intended to offend anyone. But it's a good example of how, as South Africa develops and moves further and further away from 1994, new political parties will emerge, new contradictions will emerge, new classes of people with self-interest will emerge, and they will enter into contestation with one another. New conflicts arising from the diverging interests of the erstwhile forces of liberation will be seen, as the struggle advances, so has the control, of control for resources intensified. Therefore, the development of a huge patronage network impedes genuine national development. And by this we mean those who unfairly and improperly take money that belongs to the public that is meant for the poor. In this context, it is important to reflect on what a great African revolutionary Amilcar Cabral had to say. And I quote, it is obvious that both the effectiveness of this road and the stability of the situation which it leads after liberation depend not only on the characteristics of the organization of the struggle, but also on the political and moral awareness of those for historical reasons are in a position to be immediate heirs of the colonial or neo-colonial state. It says it depends on the character of the leadership, the character of the leading activists, who constitute the political organizations that actually determines how we accomplish the aspirations that we've had. The second, of course, is something which many, particularly the Secretary General of the African National Congress, but many others as well, are saying we are a strong organization and a society, but at the same time, be aware of our weaknesses because if you ran 100 meters in 15 seconds when you were 19 years old and try to do the same when you're 39 years old, I'll be fair to the older ones, uh, you're not going to make it, am I right? So if we understand our weaknesses, then we'll try to understand how we need to correct them. And again, I go back to Cabral. Our agenda includes topics whose importance and acuteness are beyond doubt in which one concern is predominantly the case, the, the struggle. We note, however, that one type of struggle we regard as fundamental is not explicitly mentioned in this agenda. Although we are sure it was present in the minds of his predecessors, we are referring to the struggle against our own weaknesses. We admit that other cases may differ from ours. Our experience in the broad framework of the daily struggle we wage has shown that whatever difficulties the enemy may create, the weaknesses amongst ourselves is the most difficult struggle for the present and future of our peoples. And that's what you see around us today, that in any organization, from a soccer club to a religious club to political parties, it's weaknesses that arise in those organizations as a result of contestation without rules, without caring, without uh, understanding what fighting amongst ourselves does to the greater cause, to the national interest, and where the country is able to go. And if we don't understand that weakness, we can't correct it, but more importantly, it has a damaging effect for many years. The third point I want to make is that we, all of us, 
both in political organizations and civil society organizations and society more generally, have an important moral duty in the current period. One of our most important moral voices is Archbishop Tabo Makoba of the Anglican Church. And he puts it like this, and I quote, the most egregious threat to our democracy today is the insidious cancer of corruption. I cannot say it any more than corruption is anti-democracy. It is also anti-poor. Because as I said earlier on, every cent, uh, because we have representatives from certain areas which I won't mention, which are well known for the phenomenon of Uplang, um, at least somebody is awake, that's good. <laughs> So every cent we don't pay rightfully as tax, or every cent that is stolen from the fiscus that we are trying to manage is a cent or rand or a hundred rands, or as our program director said, a billion rands, which we deprive the poor in terms of roads, education, health, clinics, and social welfare. And that's the understanding that we should have uh, about the way in which that kind of corruption and uh, behavior impacts uh, on the poor, including other sections of society as well. So our goal today and in the years to come is to keep asking ourselves, as the preamble of our constitution says, are we doing all the things that are necessary to create a socially just society? <clears throat> Amartya Sen is a Nobel laureate and economist and philosopher and a few years ago, he wrote a book called The Idea of Justice. And I quote uh, briefly from it. He said, the idea of justice calls for comparisons of actual lives and iniquities rather than a remote quest for ideal institutions. And essentially, he's saying, whilst the academic debate around justice and social justice is important, what's perhaps more important is the necessity every single day to ask ourselves the question, is what we do, are we taking every opportunity we have to create a more just and fair society? And if every day we say, remove any visible sign of an injustice that we see in our society, we'll be making a contribution to a better society and a more just society. The next area we need to talk about to ourselves is this famous word that everybody seems to be using now called transformation. And transformation, you know, human beings are very good, as you know. Particularly, I don't want to offend salespeople in the audience, but uh, if I was a good salesman, I'll call everything transformation because most people will buy it. <laughs> right? So it's like this crisis we had in 2008 that started in Wall Street. Why did the crisis start? It started because Somebody decided that whether you can afford a housing loan, bond, they call it a mortgage there, or not, you must be given one. And then, what do they do? They take all of these loans or mortgages and they gift wrap them. So a person A gift wraps it and sells it to person B and says, hey, this is really good stuff in here. But person B doesn't know exactly the complexity of the product that is gift wrapped. Then person B puts another gift wrapped around it, puts slightly bigger box, it looks a bit more impressive, better color ribbon, and sells it to person C. And so it went into Europe, it went into many other parts of the world as an uh, item called a derivative. And then at the other end, at the beginning of this chain, people who were given the loans couldn't afford to pay the installments. And as a result, what was in the, in the box began to rot. And so started the great 2008-2009 recession, which we in South Africa paid a price for as, as well. And so you can see how a lousy product, if I may use that word, can become quite a damaging phenomenon, both for those who have bought it, for those who can least afford it as well. So one of the things that we need to challenge ourselves in South Africa with today is what is genuine transformation? And genuine transformation has, be, has to be in the many, many different aspects of life that need to change. But fundamentally it has to be 
that we've actually changed the day-to-day -day lives of our people. That they have better education, that they have better health, that they have better living conditions. Our cities and towns are more integrated. That they have better work opportunities. And that every single year, we can show to them that their standard of living is actually improving. And what they can afford is better than what they could have afforded two or three years before that. Because the flip side of this transformation coin, this rotten product that's in the gift wrap, is actually called rent seeking. It means every time I want to do something, I'll say, hey, this is a part of transformation. But in the meantime, what I'm doing is giving contracts to my pals and cousins. And that's also called transformation. And a lot of that is happening in our country in some of the quarters in which we have to deal with. The alternative, of course, is what the whole world today is calling inclusive growth. And it is basically saying that the way in which economies have grow, grown in countries like the United States or even in our own, that growth has created more inequality than equality. That growth in the United States, for example, what they call the middle classes, haven't really had real income growth for two decades, for 20 years. And those are the people today who are looking at uh, Mr. Trump and others as possibilities to represent them politically. And in Europe, uh, the same phenomenon, the phenomenon of exclusion, the phenomenon of not benefiting from things that are happening where the top 1% or the 10% cream off everything is resulting in right-wing populism and the growth of neo-Nazi parties as well. So, even in South Africa, the, least, the last thing we can afford is the current mode of growth that continues to replicate or uh, repeat this, uh, or increase the amount of inequality that we actually have in, in our society. And that's one of the challenges that, that we need to take on. So that's about understanding where our weaknesses are, what have we achieved, what do we still need to do, and how do we honestly confront the fact that these are tasks that actually lie ahead.